Hi, this is Tony McLaughlin, and I'm talking to Liz Oakes from MasterCard. Liz, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you, Tony, for the opportunity to do this. Liz, you are one of the go-to people in the industry, um, you know, the person that I know who has been in the weeds of faster payments developments in many different parts of the world. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience and maybe a little bit about your role at MasterCard? Certainly, absolutely. Um, so I joined MasterCard in December 2018 uh, and uh, I currently look after uh, product strategy and operations excellence across MasterCard. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have a background in payments. Uh, you and I have known each other, Tony, for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, I've been working in payments for about 25 years. Um, and, and through that, mostly in the design of um, payment systems, both central payment systems uh, for, for clearing and settlement organizations, and also um, bank uh, systems that feed into those. Um, I spent a number of years working at Vocalink, then I went into consultancy for quite a number of years, uh, both uh, KPMG and uh, laterally at McKinsey, where I was working with clients developing uh, new national payment systems, uh, schemes, also quite a lot of M&A, so kind of both front end and, and back end of, of sort of right through from consumer to bank uh, yeah. to clearing systems. Um, and, and a lot of those are very uh, sometimes adventurous and, and uh, fairly groundbreaking, innovative um, movements, jumping from legacy or, or from kind of paper-based systems right through to digital. Uh, so that's quite a, an interesting um, span of, of different challenges to take. Absolutely. On. And you've seen um, a large number of countries go through the process of developing instant payment schemes and enhance their digital payments infrastructure. And I, I'm wondering about some of the uh, best practices that you may have picked up along the way. What's, uh, what does good look like when a country is trying to upgrade its digital payments infrastructure? So I think the most important determinant of success is actually engagement and collaboration mm. across the industry. Um, what you're talking about is generally quite a significant shift for everyone in the entire country, um, mm. although they may not recognize that at the beginning. So it, it, it depends also on who's pushing hardest. So is it coming from the industry where there's a, a gap and people recognize within the you know, supply side of the market that actually yes. uh, their corporate clients, for example, need something different or, or consumers are crying out for something different? Um, that's one way that this happens. But mm -hmm. quite often um, you find that the people in society that don't have a collective voice um, push for a number of years for changes, various different changes. And, and typically that manifests in most countries with either the central bank or a government department deciding that they want to do something different Indeed. and that they actually need to push the private sector to do something different. Um, yeah. and, and so then you end up with a situation where it, it really does depend on the politics and the, the way that that country operates in terms of getting things done as to you know, who finances it, how is it, is it mandated, or is it something where the private sector steps up and says, we're going to do this and we're gonna do it in a commercially savvy or business driven mm. logic. Um, so so that you do find different approaches in terms of what it is and how it's done. Yeah. I think the most I've... important question though, in all of that is ensuring that the people at the end of the chain, so the end user, whether that's corporates or government departments or consumers, has a voice in what the actual answer looks like. Mm. Um, because otherwise you tend to, yet again, uh, design systems that are um, you know, banks or, or operators uh, designing with their best, the best interests possibly of their clients in mind, but actually they're designing it for themselves. Yeah, and I can understand that. And let's think about some of the design choices um, in different parts of the world. And I'm, I'm interested again in this idea of, of best practice. So. You know, notably in India, um, the faster payment scheme, the instant payment scheme was built on top of a digital identity scheme. Um, is that something that other countries should seek to emulate? Um, you know, if you had your druthers, if you were really able to start from a blank piece of paper, is it better to build a faster payment scheme on top of a digital identity scheme? So I think the short answer is yes. Um, I'm not sure that you would have them um, locked in in terms of dependencies. I do mm. think they are standalone things that need to coexist. So it's more a question of, um, you know, you need to be able to, to upgrade one without impacting the other uh, mm -hmm. also. But, but the question, I guess, in my mind is, 
when India started looking at what to do, they were moving very much from that paper-based uh, environment where they had 73 ACHs processing paper. Um, and, and really, you know, what, where do we go from there? So the answer to them was strikingly obviously digital. So how yeah. everybody was starting to embrace mobiles, they were just starting to embrace cards. And they looked at that and kind of said, okay, so what can we learn from other countries? And so I think this idea of, you know, cross-pollination of ideas mm. um, across the world, uh, we start to see that that is really taking off. You know, countries are learning from each other. Yes. Um, and so India looked at what was going on in China, what was going mm -hmm. on in the UK, what was happening in other countries like Singapore, uh, and, and just ge more generally around them and said, okay, so what do we need to be doing? Yes. And with a massive population and a huge, uh, you know, future, futuristic challenge ahead of them, how do you future proof that? Mm -hmm. So I think digital identity for them is a cornerstone. They looked at what goes on in the Nordics, for example, and, and learned from things like uh, the Bank Girat number in Sweden, yes. um, Bank ID or NEM ID in, in the Nordics. Uh, and they looked at other countries and how they're approaching it. And, and every country has a different way of doing these things. Absolutely. Um, but it was a fantastic opportunity for them. And the Indian government actually needed uh, digital identity for a whole host of other reasons to do yeah. with government disbursements and support payments for people. Absolutely. Um, so, so in that context, um, yes, I think for me, digital ID right now is about the intermediation of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's one of the, the core tenets of what MasterCard does. Uh, we look at, you know, how do you, how do you transact with somebody that you don't know? How do you know that yes. that entity is, is real? You're not being scammed. Uh, how do you know that you're going to get the goods or services that you're actually trying to pay for? Yeah. Um, so that's something intrinsic to how we all interact with each other, whether you're interacting with a business or a consumer or the, the government even, you know, is this really the tax department that I'm paying my taxes to? Cause that could Absolutely. be a significant fail for you. Um, so, so I think digi for me, digital ID is absolutely uh, a bedrock of yes. actually just e-commerce nowadays. Mm. Commerce. Now thinking about other countries, again, you've made the point that every country comes from a different starting point. So, um, I know that the Australian scheme was also something that you did a little bit of uh, work on, or a lot of work on, I should say. <laughs> and I'm thinking about the design choices of NPP in Australia and um, the way in which it was architected to um, have a, open the possibility of overlay services on top. So what are your thoughts in terms of best practices, in terms of what should be in the central infrastructure and, and what should be um, in layers above in terms of overlay services? So I think it's become increasingly clear over the years that the payment is not at the core of everything. Mm. Uh, the payment might be an underlying uh, activity that happens to complete a transaction or to um, you know, provide additional data alongside it may or may not fit in the payment system. So yes. the question around things like, you know, bill payments or, uh, for example, mortgages where somebody's taking out a new mortgage, there's lots of paperwork, trade finance, all these mm. things that go with it, where actually the payment might be the completing uh, activity, but it's not the entirety of the entire journey. And it also uh, shouldn't necessarily be the only intermediating step between those parties. Mm -hmm. So for me, the logic that you take uh, the payment activity and try to, for all it to all intents and purposes isolated from some of those other activities a little bit in the way that we actually design now for privacy or we design for uh, you know decoupling layers of activity from each other yes so, so the australian payment system has been designed very much in a way that that puts that core payments logic where it needs to be between those parties in the payment mm. value chain but actually other value chains that will surround that that could be to do with, for example, the exchange of healthcare data or the exchange of uh, property uh, information or something else that is intrinsic to that actual transaction. It, it has its own place and could yes. be logically separated physically from These are layers layers and then layers you can top. you can integrate as and when required, but you don't mm -hmm. necessarily they're not dependent on each other. And I think no. that that's a really important principle as you move forward. Otherwise, we end up architecting the payment system to be at the core of everything. Yes. And then we create more uh, single points of failure and critical dependency mm. that don't make sense. Okay, so it's really kind of uh, creating the payment system as being a, a, core, a core, almost like a pure service that then can be invoked by other services and you can build overlay services on top of that. I want to 
um, also ask you about, again, design and policy choices when faster payment schemes are implemented. And so, you know, a country builds a brand new shiny switch, uh, very high performance switch for faster payments. Um, you know, what's the best practice in terms of perhaps migrating traffic from other uh, legacy switches? In other words, um, is it a good idea, as Singapore has done, to migrate traffic from the, I feel like, the traditional ACH into the faster payment switch? So I'd probably look at it in a slightly different way. The first mm. question generally is, where are you driving value? So where, yeah. what are the use cases or the experiences that people are actually going to want to use this thing for? And, and start with some of those. Uh, it does help if you've got something that is um, probably not a critical area that you can test first. So pilot mm -hmm. with something that's kind of maybe cool and new, uh, but lower volumes to try to identify, uh, you know, as you roll out and pilot and test, you, you'll identify glitches or you'll figure out how to connect people. Um, then you find use cases or, or experiences that really lend themselves to the attributes of a real-time payment system. So yeah. you're looking at things that where you, if you're using ISO 20022, you, you have the propensity to carry more data. Yes. So what can you do with that? If you're, you're also perhaps guaranteeing uh, timeliness of arrival of funds and, and the fact that you can reuse those funds. So which uh, you know, instances make sense to, to actually move to that? And mm -hmm. typically, actually, um, you know, financial institutions, uh, the organizations that are providing these services to their clients have a pretty good idea who would want to be using these. Yes. So, you know, we've seen things like emergency payroll. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen things like insurance payouts when there's a, a, some kind of event that happens. Um, so very quickly, you start to see momentum building and people actually looking at this. And I think once then... The, the users actually get the hang of it and they figure out that they can get access to their funds really fast and they can also transact with each other really quickly. Then momentum tends to build. Yeah, the traffic will go to, the, to where the users want it to, uh, where they want to transact. Which, which makes more sense, both from a policy perspective and also from a, a business logic perspective. Mm -hmm. There are lots of instances where uh, right now, uh, bulk ACH file-based systems for, for many business users in particular may make sense. Um, a lot of organizations are not open in the middle of the night, so they don't necessarily want to Absolutely. receive funds in the middle of the night. Uh, they don't know what to do with them. Uh, there's no one there to process them. And if there's a problem or an error that they, they, they have to wait until the morning until they mm. deal with that. So there are you know, different uh, products and different services that lend themselves to different experiences and different Absolutely. customers. And, and I think the other thing that we've got to be mindful of is, um, you know, as we move forward with this, uh, the reach is the big issue. How do you make sure that people actually get connected to it, whether they're mm. a consumer or a business? And the disconnect for someone who is able to connect as a consumer, but their business is being charged lots of money to use it, or it doesn't work in the same way, those kind of uh, disconnects of experience are detrimental, typically yeah. for uptake. Uh, so what we've seen, a good example is Thailand, where actually mm -hmm. the government got involved and drove the whole initiative. Um, and that was about, you know, consumers being able to pay taxes and receive benefits using uh, a proxy service, using real-time payments, but, but using on their mobile phone. Absolutely. So they went mobile first. Yeah. And that, that powerful experience really drives uptake because Absolutely. once a consumer actually has it in their hands uh, and it's good, th that, just builds momentum very, very quickly. Yeah, prompt pay is a, a real standout use case. It's a real standout uh, case study. It's a very good example of a, of a well-conceived yeah. and implemented uh, faster payment scheme. But I also want to ask you about um, you know, cross-border payments because many policymakers are looking at how to make cross-border payments uh, more efficient. And one of the potential answers is the interconnectivity or the interoperability between uh, faster payment schemes, but I think you and I in our career, we saw many um, attempts to connect traditional ACHs, which fell flat on their face. Um, so what, what will it take to uh, connect the faster payment schemes and turn those into really an instant cross-border experience? So I agree. The problems are well known and well documented. I think we've recently seen you know, work that the CPMI and the BIS are doing in this area. Yes. And, and that I think the most challenging part of this is um, 
a disconnect in different countries between you know, anti-money laundering sy uh, systems or controls, um, the expectations around reporting, the expectations around, um, you know, whether it's foreign exchange handling. Mm. There are so many different layers to the cross-border piece that are not necessarily uh, present in the domestic environment. Uh, it's much harder to identify your counterparty. It's also much harder to identify beneficial ownership. And, and so some of those challenges are actually almost industry level challenges around identity. So it goes back to some of those things we were talking about earlier um, that will build, as you build all those components, it will start to make cross-border yes. uh, a little bit more, uh, yeah. a little bit easier to manage. I think for me, the technology side of it is not the outstanding challenge. Messaging challenge, is simple. Messaging is simple. You know, <laughs> you can send people an email and say, hi, I'm giving you $20. Uh, it doesn't mean they've got the money. So the question is, how are they going to get the, the money? And people underestimate, um, I think, quite often the banking side of this. So we have to put mm. the fin back into fintech. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more challenging than just saying, I owe you, I've promised to give you money, therefore you have it. Uh, we actually have to figure out how to move the money. And you know, that Absolutely. goes back to how does correspondent banking work? How do we affect settlement properly at, in central bank funds or, or even commercial back, backed money that uh, people have trust in? And so it goes back to that trust and intermediation question. Um, throw in a bit of foreign exchange uh, and, then, and then the challenge of, well, is your counterparty really who you say it is? Mm. Um, and to this day, we still have lots of court cases that go on and lots of uh, interesting experiences, both in the business level and also the consumer level with some of these cross-border transactions. And, and if you think about, well, if I think about the level of fraud and scams that exist domestically right now in any of our countries, um, you know, look at cross-border and, and people are quite wary of, of those transactions. Um, so this is where we have to put um, more effort, I think, you know, to collaborate in the, across all of these different countries to figure out some international standards, international ways of yeah. working. Um, and all roads seem to lead back to this question of identity and establishing who you're doing business with. But I also want to ask you, because there's been a, you know, you had a recent acquisition in, in MasterCard, which, if you like, has really emphasized your multi-rail, uh, you know, strategy, which is a journey that you've been on for quite some time. So I'm interested very much in your view in terms of how all of these different aspects come together. Faster, we have faster payments, we have open banking, we have digital identity, we have stable coins, we have potentially central bank digital currencies a heady mix of developments in the digital payment space. How do you see all of this playing out? So it's a very exciting time to be at the heart of all of these developments. I have to say <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing to see the amount of investment and thinking that is going on. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, I, I think sometimes the question is what particular problems are we trying to fix or what opportunities are we trying to pursue? Um, so there are so many different questions being answered by all the things you just mentioned. Yes. Um, so, you know, in, in some cases, uh, and if you, if I boil it back down to a sort of a consumer experience or as an individual experience, you know, what are the challenges that people are facing? They're trying to transact with someone in another country and it's really difficult. It takes too long. It's too expensive. And they never know if the money gets there. Mm. Um, it, they may live in a country where the government is unstable or the inflation rate is, is such that it's actually, you know, prohibiting kind of that, how you want to live your life. Uh, and they're seeking uh, certainty and safety and, and flight to security in another currency. Yes. Um, so th there are so many different components to the challenges that we're trying to address. Uh, and I think sometimes we have to just call out and recognize this solution is designed to fix the, or address these problems and these Absolutely. challenges and opportunities, but it doesn't fix everything. I guess from a MasterCard perspective, your real kind of core mission is to enable people to transact with trust domestically and internationally and instantly. And that's why you're, uh, I feel like broadening your, your reach and leveraging other types of rails to achieve that core mission. Absolutely. And, and we recognize that, um, you know, in particular businesses need better options. Um, a lot of the transactions that are done between businesses are slow and cumbersome. Um, and, and I think the world in which we are now living in and increasingly where we're moving, where everything is faster. Uh, we have a gig economy. We have 
uh, less certainty about who my employee is, never mind who my customer is. Um, so it, everything is changing in that dynamic and that certainty yeah. around who is that person, who is that entity, is that business actually who I think it is, are they located yeah. where I think they are, um, is definitely a, a big challenge for everyone. Um, yeah. I also th see that there's a huge amount of data that actually transacts along the flow that could open up opportunities and create a uh, fantastic uh, expansion in GDP potentially, where we can actually offer people, you know, supply chain finance, working capital. Um, mm. I think the credit lending portfolio, you, know, you alluded to Finicity, the ability to actually look at transactional data and extend people uh, credit based on transactional history rather than um, you know, a credit rating system in the past that might've had different outputs or different conclusions. Yes. So I think th that opportunity is quite significant um, and that's where this is going. Yeah. But it, it's gonna take us a while to put all those pieces together. And, and Liz, as you said, it's a question of uh, providing certainty in an uncertain environment and we are living through one of the most uncertain environments in our in our lives um and i don't know if we're in lockdown out of lockdown where we exactly are but um you know what what have been your reflections i mean as the as the world has gone crazy around us um you know what what are the kind of like certainties and solid foundations that you have kind of um fallen back on to to get through this strange period so I think, uh, firstly, on a personal level, uh, what I've really noticed is um, a, a much stronger sense of empathy. Mm. So um, as an Irish person, when I first arrived in the UK um, and people would ask me, how, I, how are you? Um, in Ireland, people would respond with exactly how they are. Uh, <laughs> and you'd have a genuine conversation and they'd ask about your family and all the, because it's a smaller environment. Um, it took me a long time to get used to the idea that actually generally people aren't even vaguely interested and everyone just says fine um nowadays and i'm sure you have this everyone wants to know how are you are you okay is your family okay um you know are you able to to work where you are uh, are you able to travel are you able to you know function they genuinely are interested because everyone knows that actually uh, there are other things now in your life that might impede yes. your ability uh, mm -hmm. to react to what they're asking you and, and so I think that to start off with, I think will give us uh, hopefully a better society, a better interaction with each other. I think also people are very conscious of each other's mental health. So there's mm. a lot more, I think that empathy will drive out better behavior. Yeah. And, and on, a, on a more practical level from a sort of a business perspective, I think that we have definitely, we are focused much more on relevant, useful innovation. Um, mm. So initially, you know, fixing things, um, making it easier for uh, brick and mortar businesses to go online, um, helping small businesses to get funding, um, helping people to survive through this. And I think that focus for me is, is really a reflection on what is important in our lives. And I, I, that Absolutely. is amazing. Uh, and, and the scramble to do that in, in locations all over the world has been fabulous yeah. to see. Well, that's a, a, a great lesson, you know, empathy, you know, for other people in our personal lives. And also, uh, I like that connection into empathy for, you know, end users when we're designing products and services, I think is a great point to, uh, to end on. And Liz, I just want to reiterate that, uh, you know, you're one of the most thoughtful, experienced and highly networked people that I have the pleasure to know in the industry. And it's a genuine pleasure to get your insights today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tony. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.